I don't have any family. No. Wait. There was a man who said he was my father. Where is he? Dead. By my own hand. Big Boss. What? Big Boss? I had no idea. There was no way you could. It happened in Zanzibar six years ago. So as we dive back into the events after 1995, right after the fall of Outer Heaven with the death of the Phantom, Solid Snake aka David leaves Foxhound, he's shaken and done with the unit, taking on work as a mercenary for hire. Ironically, he follows in Big Boss's footsteps here, maybe against his better judgement but more as a way to survive. I'm just a man who's good at what he does, killing. There's no winning or losing for a mercenary. Eventually though he gives up certain techniques, especially CQC, close quarters combat, because after Big Boss's betrayal, those moves now carry some heavy baggage. Big Boss? Never felt right using a technique learned from a man who betrayed his unit. Thinking bag. CQC as a concept was way ahead of its time. And once he's made enough money, he retreats from it all, stepping back in the Canadian wilderness. There he spends a few years, isolated but struggling with the memories of Outer Heaven and the ghosts of Big Boss, haunting him with his PTSD that he can't seem to shake. The setup here is almost like David can't escape Big Boss's shadow. Even in solitude he's created, he's not quiet before the storm, the nightmares that seem to linger. Before he's pulled back in Operation Intrude, F014. Now this is arguably one of the most intense missions in Solid Snake's entire career. His objective to infiltrate the military nation of Zanzibarland. This isn't just some small base. We're talking about a highly fortified, well-defended nation with over 40,000 residents across a sprawling 450 kilometers, or roughly 280,000 square miles. It is a landlocked stronghold in Central Asia, positioned between some of the most strategic hotspots bordered by the former Soviet Union, China, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Zanzibar's land's defences were next level. They'd set up sensor networks around the cliffs, ready to detect intruders trying to scale the mountains. Inside the fortress, there were layers of hostile terrain, with locations like the Zanzibar building, Mazewood, a treacherous swamp. Now, according to later sources, Zanzibar land is situated in Central Asia, but here's where things get murky. Modern sources still hint it borders the Middle East, despite the separation by Pakistan and Afghanistan. And just to add to the confusion, the name Zanzibar matches an entirely different region over in Tanzania, East Africa. So there's a bit of ambiguity, almost adding to the mythos of this place. It's like everywhere and nowhere all at once, a true phantom nation. In Zanzibar land's southern region, you get a dense jungle and swamp area, stretching northward, merging into desert and mountain landscapes. The whole layout shares some striking similarities with Selinoyarsk, that rugged Soviet territory in Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. In Project Ito's novelization of Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots, there's even a hint that Big Boss might have chosen this location because it feels familiar. Now let's take a moment to talk about the late Satoshi Aito, better known by his pen name Project Ito. Ito was a Japanese science fiction author and illustrator who became a big name in Metal Gear's community, particular for his novelization of Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots. Long before his professional career, Aito was a dedicated fan artist, creating Metal Gear inspired Do Shinshi and fan fiction, which he shared on his now defunct website, Spook Tales. His passion and talent eventually caught the attention of Hideo Kojima himself, and Aito went from a fan to a contributor influencing the Metal Gear canon in ways that only a true fan could. Sadly, Ito passed away at the age of 34 on March 20th, 2009, after a long battle with cancer. Kojima honoured him by dedicating the ending of Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker to Aito's memory. Originally, Kojima had hoped that Aito would go on to write more novelizations for Metal Gear Solid in the series, but after Aito's passing, other writers took over these tasks. But even so, Aito's influence remains undeniable. 
In his Guns of the Patriots novelisation, it's hinted that locations of Zanzibar land and Salina Yask might be one and the same. A theory that had actually been subtly implied in Metal Gear Solid 3 materials re-released post-launch, long before Metal Gear Solid 4 even existed. Aito's depth of knowledge about Metal Gear's world would have allowed him to add these layers of mystery and speculation that fans love. The very idea of Solid Snake sneaking through the same territory where his father undertook his first big mission resonates with fans, adding to that mystique of Zanzibar land as more than just a fortress. It's almost sacred ground, where Snake and Big Boss's paths symbolically intersect. At some point, Solid Snake would be brought back into action through Foxhound's new commander, Roy Campbell, to undertake a mission in Zanzibar land, and according to Campbell's intel, this newly formed military nation had kidnapped Dr. Keo Marv, the brilliant scientist behind a revolutionary oil refining microbe known as Oilix. But the stakes were even higher. Reports indicated that Zanzibar land was developing a new type of Metal Gear. Dr. Marv's accidental discovery came while he was conducting research on biomass pesticide modifications in the East. Through a fortunate twist in his experiments, he uncovered the basis for Oilix and soon completed it. Oilix was a microgal organism with the capacity to produce high-grade petroleum, hydrocarbons efficiently and affordably. At a time of global fuel shortages in 1999, this discovery represented a lifeline. But just as Dr. Marv, along with the STB agent Gustavo Hefner and fellow scientist Dr. Madnar, was en route to an international energy crisis summit, Zanzibar Land's agents abducted them in the United States. The situation was dire, as Dr. Marv was transported to Zanzibar Land's fortress, keeping him captive. He was then interrogated and pressured to divulge the formula for Oilix as Big Boss's forces aimed to use it to gain global influence. Knowing the desert terrain of Zanzibar land provided the ideal environment for Oilix production. Big Boss saw an opportunity to control the world's oil market and with it, the economies of nearly every major nation. In the throes of an energy crisis, Oilix offered a vision of hope, capable of yielding significant crude oil from microalgae. Every kilogram of Oilix algae could produce up to 800 grams of crude oil, with a yield conversion that allowed 70% to become gasoline and 25% to become aviation fuel, boasting a 96 octane rating. On top of that, each hectare of Oilix algae could produce up to 85 kilograms of oil daily, surpassing other alternative energy sources like methanol, sand oil and shale oil in cost effectiveness and production. In Metal Gear's timeline, Oilix offered a solution to the energy crisis. The world was clearly suffering with resources, but it also fueled Big Boss's ambitions. With Oilix under his control, he stood poised to dominate the global economy, making him a prime target of the United States, guided by the secretive patriots, who no doubt wanted to get their hands on this as well. Interestingly, Oilix has real-world roots inspired by the actual microlich, known as Botryococcus brawni, which has been researched with biofuel potential. Although with petroleum remains the preferred source of fuel for today, the potential for biofuel continues to be explored. However, within the Metal Gear universe, Oilix is rarely referenced after the events of Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, aside from a brief mention in the previous Operation Summary in Metal Gear Solid. In Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots, Campbell and Big Mummer hint at the consequences of the oil market's collapse, marking the world's pivot to the war economy and describing how oil and fuel have by then become rare as diamonds. With so many wars being waged, oil and biofuel have become as precious as diamonds. Oilix's impact on Metal Gear's universe is fascinating and very ambiguous. It should have solved the world's oil crisis, providing a sustainable fuel source. So why in the series' future does the world still seem to suffer from resource scarcity, according to Eva, and a dependency on the war economy? While the existence of Oilix could theoretically prevent any energy shortages, it's possible that the drive for endless warfare in Metal Gear would have more to do with control and profit than true lack of resources. 
If private forces are using oil licks to power the war machine, energy production might not actually be the issue. Instead, the scarcity of accessible commodities in war-torn regions could be the real problem. The idea is hinted again in Metal Gear Solid Rising, where Doctor mentions that the Patriots were close to discovering a perpetual energy source before their collapse. Oh, Patriot Data, yes! Oh? I had no idea they were so close to a perpetual energy source. Fascinating! Though he doesn't mention the name Oilix, this line raises the question of whenever the Patriots may have attempted to confiscate or study Oilix to leverage its potential as a sustainable power source to drive the war economy. In the broader Metal Gear storyline, resources like oil, precious metals and diamonds play an essential role in the global conflicts that echo real-world exploitation. Metal Gear Solid V in particular reflects this. The reason for the current armed conflict goes back to World War I. After the war, their land was colonized by a European power, and it decided to give local control to the Buta. That split the two groups into rulers and subjects, laying the foundations for an inevitable civil war. The friction between them remained even after they won independence from Europe. The Buta are holding on to power to this day, and the Mbele rebels continue to fight back. The conflict is funded by locally mined gold, rare metals, diamonds. They've used the money from those to arm themselves, buy oil and even hire PFs. The Buta administration owns the mining rights to Kungenga Mine. But most of the laborers are Mbele, who they've taken prisoner. The product they've gouged out of their land is bought up by cheap Western corporations. And the civil war is fueled by the profits. That's how it goes. One country's people is split apart by another country. Then the two groups tear up their own land for money in order to fight each other. Now this civil war started by a foreign power is the norm. And it's sucking up all the country's resources. PFs are just the same. They follow the money, taking war with them wherever they go. That goes for us too. It's an endless river of bloody retaliation, and we're standing downstream. Should we make a stand and staunch the flow? Or wade in amongst the corpses and make a bigger splash than the rest? We'll follow your lead, boss. Their lives for a fistful of diamonds, huh? And what happens after that? with African nations stripped of their resources and exploited for their minerals and diamonds to fuel the war economy, and just overall different nations. Yet Oilix itself is a crucial driver in Metal Gear 2's narrative, symbolising both the potential for a solution to energy dependence and the peril of letting such power fall into the wrong hands. Solid Snake's mission objectives for Operation Intrude F-014 were clear yet daunting. Infiltrate the heavily fortified walls of Zanzibar land, rescue Dr. Marv, and secure the Oilix formula. The Zanzibar building, the central stronghold within the Zanzibar fortress, this was no simple infiltration. The Zanzibar building was a four-storey structure under constant round-the-clock surveillance, with a vast network of support facilities providing continuous operational backup. Located at the southern entrance, the building was heavily guarded, with a locked gate, wire fencing and constant patrols at every access point. Due to the fortress being on high alert, even the ventilation shafts were a challenge, generating radar jamming signals to prevent detection of intruders. Guard patrols were more intense and precise than those Snake encountered in Outer Heaven, reflecting Zanzibar Land's advanced security systems. And with this, Snake's own skills had evolved, making him more refined, Stealth-focused operator prepared to face this near-impenetrable fortress. Hey! You're not thinking of going to Grozny Grad. Are you mad? It's an impenetrable fortress. I'm sure it is. Solid Snake's mission was no ordinary infiltration. Every weapon and tool had to be found on site within Zanzibar land, proving just how capable he was under pressure. Earlier on, he's contacted by Holly White, an agent posing as a journalist who had infiltrated a month prior. Holly knew the fortress layout and offered her help, mirroring Kyle Schneider's role in Outer Heaven, and like Schneider, who had provided crucial intel until his disappearance in Outer Heaven. Holly served as a key ally, guiding Snake through the labyrinthine stronghold. 
Alongside Snake's solo efforts, he received essential radio support from his mentor, Master Miller, known as Hell Master within Fox Sound. Miller was a drill sergeant and respected by all. Snake looked up to him with good reason. Miller had been brought in by Roy Campbell as a survival specialist for the mission in Zanzibar land, offering Snake critical guidance on survival techniques. Zanzibar Land even had its own national anthem, a military-style patriotic composition that demanded respect from every soldier whenever it played, especially in the central command room of Zanzibar's building. Soldiers would immediately stop and stand at attention, and interestingly the anthem had a melody faintly similar to We Wish You A Merry Christmas, fitting Big Boss's peculiar love for the holiday season, and for all his ruthless ambition, he is a true believer in Christmas and Santa Claus himself. Uh, I don't know much about what goes on up in the sky. What I do know is that Nora had tracked Santa Claus on its radar. <laughs> nice one. I didn't know you were a comedian too. Huh? No, I'm serious. <laughs> it's true, Norad tracks is... <laughs> Listen to me. Every December, they set up a hotline and... <laughs> okay, okay, I get it. He's real, I tell ya. He used to bring me presents and... Snake eventually makes his way to the elevator, landing on the second floor to grab the level 1 keycard. The second floor is heavily guarded with grated metal floors that make it easy to give away his position. He then heads up to the third floor, used for the R&D, where specialised equipment like night vision goggles and mine detectors are stored. Some areas here are filled with gas, so personnel are equipped with gas masks. In one room, Snake eventually encounters what he initially thinks is Dr. Marv, but it turns out to be Black Ninja a mercenary acting as a decoy after removing a transmitter hidden in Dr. Marv's tooth. Black Ninja, a former member of the NASA's top secret Extraterrestrial Environment Special Forces Unit, is outfitted with experimental flex armor and enhanced reflexes. He attacks Snake with incredible speed and throwing stars. During the fight, Snake contacts George Kasler over the codec. Kasla, an American mercenary and Foxhound advisor, has intel on every active mercenary worldwide. He provides Snake with crucial information, guiding him through Zanzibar Land's elite defences. Snake has to stay sharp in battle against Black Ninja, whose speed and agility make him a deadly foe. The mercenary teleports around the room, throwing ninja stars at a rapid pace. Snake relies on his adaptive skills, taking his time and making each M9 shot count to counter the relentless assault. Despite Black Ninja's enhanced abilities, Snake's experience allows him to eventually defeat him. As Black Ninja falls, a dying Schneider reveals his true identity to Snake, sharing what had become of him, and the Resistance and the Children of Outer Heaven after Operation Intrude N313. In a twist, Schneider had survived the bombing campaign by NATO, narrowly escaping with Big Boss's help. Schneider with his dying breath explains the brutal nature of NATO's bombing campaign against Outer Heaven, mercilessly killing all their resistance fighters and the children of Outer Heaven. He paints a grim picture showing how little they cared for their lives lost in their pursuit of power. Despite his past opposition to Outer Heaven, Schneider's gratitude shines through as he recounts how Big Boss gave him a second chance, saving him from certain death. It was Big Boss who brought him to Zanzibar after offering a place in his new nation. Before Schneider passes, he gives Snake one last piece of crucial advice. There's a soldier wearing a green beret on the first floor, keeping watch over Dr. Marv's cell. Schneider is a victim of the times, and in this harsh reality, we're met with the boss's famous quote, a reminder of the harsh reality of war. Is there such thing as an absolute timeless enemy? There is no such thing and never has been. And the reason that is our enemies are human beings like us, they can only be our enemies in relative terms. Which seems very fitting for a moment like this. Now with this knowledge, Snake sets his sights on the first floor, determined to locate the soldier and move one step closer to finding the truth, and that means finding Dr. Marv. Snake eventually finds the soldier with a green beret and remains undetected, carefully tailing him through a maze-like jungle. The paranoid soldier constantly looks over his shoulder, 
giving Snake the opportunity to stay hidden. They reach a prison room where Snake hears a series of knocking patterns, leading him to believe it's Dr. Marv's signal. However, upon investigation, he discovers it's actually Dr. Madnar who had been rescued by Snake during the Outer Heaven Uprising. Madnar, who had once worked with Big Boss, had defected to Zanzibar land after being ostracized by the scientific community in the United States. Pressured into creating weapons for the American government, who wanted him to work on technologies such as SDIs and NEWs, and even brain bombs, while which not related to Fox Die play a very similar role in its purpose. So as we know, Fox Die is a retrovirus engineered by the Pentagon's DIA, created with the ability to selectively target and kill specific individuals by recognizing their unique DNA markers, causing cardiac arrest. Naomi Hunter, working under orders from Snake's handlers, implanted Snake with this virus to serve as a vector, designed to eliminate Liquid Snake. The Fox Die virus within Snake's own body was a ticking time bomb, capable of killing him at any moment, turning him into an unwitting pawn in the larger game of the Patriots' control. The Patriots, however, had a darker vision for controlling their agents. Their use of Fox Die is just one example of their approach. Similar to Madnar's experiments, they wanted him to develop with tiny devices implanted into the minds of their agents to kill switches in case anyone with their ranks becomes a threat or try to leak secrets. One of the clearest examples of this is Richard Ames, who was forced into revealing the truth about the Patriots. His heart attack was the final fatal move, his kill switch activated, ensuring his silence. All thanks to the first generation nanomachines that caused Ames to succumb to his death, with the Patriots shutting down his pacemaker. Dr. Madnard hoped to develop a new Metal Gear, but his radical ideas were rejected, and of course he would find refuge in Zanzibar land, Madnar would continue his work developing for Metal Gear D, and even became a double agent leaking secrets to Zanzibar land. It was inside his cell that Madner explains that Dr. Marb was relocated to the tower building and that they were both kidnapped to continue the work on Metal Gear. Dr. Madner, the ever brilliant but conflicted scientist, reveals to Snake the true nature of Zanzibar Land's new weapon, the Metal Gear D. While the TX-55 Metal Gear was the prototype, Metal Gear D was a far more advanced and deadly machine with streamlined design and enhanced weaponry. Metal Gear D was a formidable nuclear weapon capable of actually launching nukes. Madner explains that Big Boss had planned to mass produce these weapons, positioning Zanzibar land as the world's most powerful nuclear force and Big Boss becoming exactly the very things that he fought against. A leader determined to push out his own agendas and beliefs onto the world and by mass producing weapons of mass destruction, just like Colonel Volgin. A completed prototype now sits in the hangar. At present, it is the only one of its kind. But Volkin is planning to mass produce them. Madna, though initially repelled by the TX-55's creation of no choice of his own, designed Metal Gear D on his own free will. As dangerous as it was, it would become the backbone of Big Boss's strategy, allowing him to raid nuclear disposal sites around the globe and secure enough nuclear stockpiles to make Zanzibar land the only nation with access to nuclear weapons. With this power, Big Boss became a far greater threat than before, his grasp on the global power tightening. In a final revelation, Madnar confirms what Snake had feared. Big Boss survived their battle in Outer Heaven. The truth still hanging heavy in the air. Unable to reach Dr. Marv, Snake promises to return for Dr. Madnar once his mission is complete and he has found Dr. Marv. But in all the midst of the conversation, Dr. Madnar passes on a codec frequency to Solid Snake of one of his friends who is a zoologist called Jacobson who apparently lives very close by into the area who knows a lot about the wildlife in Zanzibar land. With that in mind, Snake makes his way out to try and find out what information he can get on Dr. Marv. As Snake pushes deeper into Zanzibar land, he unknowingly stumbles into a minefield. The familiar beeping of the codec pulls him out of his thoughts. It's an anonymous caller claiming to be his greatest fan. The connection flickers with the static bringing to mind the distorted codec screens fans know from MGS1 and MGS2 and immediately hinting at a figure from Snake's past, Grey Fox. With no mine detector on hand, Snake relies on his instincts, crawling on the ground to collect the mines, which might come in handy later on. But his challenges aren't over yet. He soon finds himself at the edge of a treacherous swamp, leading to a seemingly bottomless pit. Using every bit of his survival experience, Snake navigates over patches of solid ground. Inching his way across, it's here that he catches a glimpse of the orphan children who live in this war-torn land, 
reminders of the harsh reality Big Boss's nation imposes even on its youngest residents. After navigating the swamp and slipping past a patrol, Snake reaches the armory building. Inside, he encounters another of Big Boss's elite mercenary, known as Running Man. Confident and taunting, Running Man brags about being the fastest mercenary in the world, daring Snake to keep up with him. Without warning, he releases nerve gas, forcing Snake into a race against time to survive. Thinking quickly, Snake contacts Kazla for intel. Kazla fills him in that Running Man was once a star athlete known for his record-breaking speed at the Barcelona Olympics, clocking in at about 9.69 seconds in the 100-metre dash. But his career ended in disgrace when he was caught doping. Now he's using his speed for all the wrong reasons, wrecking havoc across Europe before finding his way into Big Boss's ranks. Solid Snake realises that outrunning him isn't going to be an option, but outsmarting him is. Snake sets a trap, laying down the mines he'd gathered earlier to cut off Running Man's escape. In a test of wits over speed, Snake turns the tables, showing once again why he's the smartest soldier in the field, and that simply, Running Man just wasn't fast enough to outsmart this Snake. Making his way back to Zanzibar building, Snake sneaked past guards, cameras, and even unoccupied tanks, thankfully, in the search of a vital piece of equipment, the Stinger missile launcher. Navigating tight security, he slips into a supply room and grabs the launcher and heads back outside. On his way past the minefield, an enemy gunship blocks his path, a hind hovering ominously in his way. With calm precision, Snake takes aim, locking onto the hind with the Stinger, Timing his shots with perfect accuracy, he brings down the gunship in one decisive blow, clearing a path forward. Snake approaches the tower building, a massive 30-storey structure towering around 600 metres in the heart of Zanzibar's fortress, serving as the main government building. It stands tall enough to oversee all of Zanzibar land housing key offices and personnel. Blocked from entering through the main door without clearance, Snake has to get creative. Spotting a nearby truck, he retrieves a cardboard box and slips onto a conveyor belt, blending him in with the shipments. Using the box as cover, he successfully sneaks into the building, moving deeper into the heart of Big Boss's stronghold. Out of nowhere, Snake receives a call from Holly, who explains she's been captured and is being held prisoner. Trying to help Snake narrow down her location, Holly mentions she was blindfolded and unsure where she has been taken, but recalls sounds that might help. Elevator noises on either side and the rush of water in front and behind her. Using her hints, Snake navigates the maze-like hallways of a tower building, carefully manoeuvring past tight corners, patrolling guards and grated floors that threaten to give away his position. Eventually, he reaches the third inner elevator and descends, finding himself in the dim, echoing depths of the sewers. Snake makes his way through the sewers, a damp, foul-smelling labyrinth where often kids roam in miserable conditions. The unconventional layout here feels unsettling, with rooms stocked with weaponry scattered in this unlikely decaying maze. Among the supplies, Snake grabs some plastic explosives and recalls Holly's description of this exact location. With a plan in mind, he locates a wall, blows it open and finally reunites with Holly, who is visibly relieved. Ever the charmer, Snake can't help but express surprise at her looks, hinting that she's even prettier than he expected. After the brief reunion, Snake asks Holly about Dr. Marv. Though she hasn't met him, Holly explains that Marv recently sent a message by Carrier Pigeon. She recalls watching the pigeon fly towards the elevator into the tower building, with Snake hinting that it's likely aiming for the roof. With urgency in her voice, Holly tells Snake that guards are also on the hunt for the pigeon, realising the message's critical importance. Deciding to gather more intel, Holly leaves Snake to embark on this wild chase across the tower, hoping that tracking down the pigeon will bring him closer to finding Dr. Marv.
Navigating his way through the sewers, Snake takes a calculated plunge, fast travelling to a passage that leads him back to the Zanzibar building's first floor basement, the armory. Here, he's surrounded by an array of infantry equipment from grenades and submachine guns to camouflage mats and body armour. Knowing he could use a little extra firepower, Snake stocks up on some grenades, figuring they'll come in handy for whatever lies ahead. Snake retraces his steps, heading back through the sewers and into the elevator into the tower building. It's a long, tense ride up the 30th floor, where he's met with an ambush. Laser sensors line the room, a trap set by the mercenary Red Blaster. Perched high, scaling the walls with grenades in hand, Red Blaster is ready to make Snake's demise a slow and painful one as possible. Snake quickly contacts Kassler, who fills him in on his opponent, an elite assassin with a passion for explosives, known for laying out brutal booby traps to corner his prey. Kassler advises Snake to turn the tables, lob a few grenades of his own to force Red Blaster out of hiding. Ready to use the enemy's methods against him, Snake arms himself for the fight. With Red Blaster taken down, Snake continues his ascent, climbing two more floors to reach the roof. Just then he gets a call from Holly, she explains that the door up top has been painted shut, a makeshift attempt to keep intruders out. However, she hints that it's only jury rigged, some plastic explosives should be enough to blow it wide open. Armed and ready, Snake prepares to blast his way through, knowing that he's one step closer to finding Dr. Marth. On the rooftop, Snake spots the pigeon carrying Dr. Marv's message, but the bird's flighty nature makes it merely impossible to catch. Thinking quickly, he contacts Jacobson, the zoologist, for advice. Jacobson tells Snake that pigeons are sensitive to noise, but have an insatiable appetite, especially for grains. He suggests using some of Snake's rations, perhaps potatoes or beans, to lure it in. Sure enough, with a bit of patience, the pigeon lands to nibble on the food. Snake carefully retrieves the message tied to its leg, revealing a plea for help, along with a scrambled series of letters, a hidden clue to Dr. Marv's codec frequency. After attempting to contact Dr. Marv, Snake realises there's a serious language barrier. Dr. Marv's check is completely lost on him. He turns to Dr. Madnar for help, but Madnar explains he only speaks Russian and English. However, he suggests Snake might be able to get help from Gustava, who is fluent in Czechoslovakian. Who could translate. Madnar explains that she managed to escape capture by disguising herself in an enemy uniform. When Snake asks if she has a radio, Madnar tells him it was confiscated and that she's the only woman in a male-dominated military unit so she shouldn't be hard to find. With that slim lead, Madnar suggests Snake could try setting up an ambush near the woman's restroom to catch her off guard, as that's the likeliest place to find her in hiding. Venturing back to the main Zanzibar building, Snake arrives on the fourth floor. Navigating through the soldiers' living quarters, the layout is a maze of narrow corridors, sensor beams and cameras. Avoiding guards, he moves through a darkened room, crawling through a vent into another space. But to Snake's surprise, the room is filled with soldiers, though upon closer inspection, they're only dummies meant to fool intruders. Sensing the trap, Snake cautiously manoeuvres through, sharp-eyed for any real soldiers among the decoys. Eventually, Snake reaches the mess hall and slips into the women's restroom, where he finds Gustava waiting. After a brief exchange, Gustava is relieved to her that Dr. Marv is still alive. Snake hands her Marv's codec frequency, trusting her knowledge of his language to help guide them. Gustava contacts Marv and learns that he's secured in a cell on the far side of a large crevice north of the tower. Marv urgently requests rescue, while Snake assures Gustava that Dr. Madna is also safe. She quickly leads the way, saying she knows a shortcut to the crevice through an old sewer system beneath the tower. As they descend to the bottom floor, they encounter a line of bulldozers charging through the path. Their relentless speed, turning the journey deadly. Snake has to move carefully to avoid the bulldozers, eventually making it to another elevator at the end of the passage. This leads them directly to Dr. Madna's cell, where he hands Snake a level 5 keycard, essential for progressing through the facility. Moving through the murky underpasses of Zanzibar, Snake, Gustava and Madnar take a moment to rest in the sewer's dank tunnels. But then, Madnar suspiciously excuses himself, claiming he has some business to take care of. 
Snake and Gustavo are left alone, and they share a rare intimate conversation amidst the grim surroundings. Gustavo muses on the unlikely group they make, a world-renowned scientist, a former Olympic athlete, and an elite soldier trudging together through a sewer. Snake reflects on fate's peculiar twists, while Gustavo speaks of her mother's harrowing experience during World War II. Her mother, a Holocaust survivor, once fled through Warsaw's sewers to escape the Nazi occupation, her appearance nearly unrecognisable beneath layers of mud. The story strikes a nerve for Gustava, who sees parallels between her mother's suffering and her own. Snake Curious asks why Gustava quit skating and joined the STB. She explains that as an Olympic medalist, she had once been given special treatment, even in the East. But then she turns the conversation back on Snake, asking if he's married. Snake's response is simple, that he has no family. Her response is raw and emotional, she feels alone, but out of no choice of her own, it's more a matter of missed opportunities. She reveals a past love of a man from the West named Frank Hunter. She was so deeply in love with him that she'd be willing to leave everything behind to be with him. She had even attempted to defect, but her bid for asylum was denied at the last moment likely for political reasons. The refusal branded her family as Rusfuniks, stripping them to their rights to compete, forcing her into the STB and plunging her into a nightmare. Yet despite all of this, she has no regrets. Her time as a skater was fulfilling, but it's through her current life that she has learned true strength, even if it meant having to kill a man. Snake presses further, asking if she ever really saw Grey Fox again and Gustava sadly explains that the Berlin Wall was an unescapable barrier between them. Their love was a casualty of the Cold War, just as they were victims of their time. The Berlin Wall was erected overnight on August 13th, 1961. It symbolised a world divided in a complex system of barriers, from barbed wire and guard towers to landmines, and the infamous Death Strip, cutting the East Berlin off from the West, it stood as an imposing reminder of ideological division, splitting families, friends, and even lovers like Gustava and Frank. In Metal Gear, this tragic period in history weaves through its narrative. It reflects on the themes of defection and nations using their citizens like pawns. It calls to mind the story of Sokolov in Metal Gear Solid 3. The scientist who in 1962 was promised asylum by the CIA and taken to the US, Major Zero's operation helped Sokolov's family defect first, with Sokolov following two weeks later. But the long journey spanning over 500 miles to reach the West Berlin emphasised the challenges and risks defectors faced, caught between the whims of their homeland and the uncertainty of their future. As with Snake and Gustavo, where they shared their stories, they acknowledged the heavy price for people like themselves, and people like Sokolov, who simply paid the price for wanting freedom in a world where nations control fate with a cold hand. It's the complex web of East versus West, something that is mirrored within to Metal Gear's narrative, reflected in the lives of these characters, and it underlines the haunting reality of a world not just split by borders, but by broken dreams. In the theme of Metal Gear is the narratives that are woven together, and the characters that share parallels and connections that are very profound. And the Cold War is what caused this chain reaction in the entire world affecting everybody in it. It was a true shift of the times, both technologically, economically, and has sparked local conflicts with lasting consequences. After the end of World War II, the world was split into two, East and West. This marked the beginning of the era called the Cold War. Finally reaching the surface, Snake steps out into the open air and heads towards the infamous Bridge of Sorrows, a large crevice to the north of the tower building. This natural boundary is what splits the main Zanzibar fortress from the detention camp and other classified areas. The Bridge of Sorrows is the only footpath that crosses the chasm, a perilous link between Snake and his objective, but the bridge will bear witness to a tragic moment that changes the course of Snake's mission. Dr. Madnar crosses the bridge first, eventually followed by Gustava as she steps onto the bridge. A missile crashes into it with explosive force, tearing the structure apart and sending Gustava hurling backward. The pilot of the weapon that struck her, none other than former lover Frank Jaeger, now Grey Fox, piloting Metal Gear D in this weird bit of irony. Snake rushes to Gustava's side, the cold reality of her injuries sinking in as they share an emotional final conversation. Gustavo opens up about her regrets and hands Snake two crucial items, a level 6 keycard and a Zanzibar brooch. 
It's important to a mystery that she cannot explain. As her breath grows weaker, her last words are a soft call to Frank, before her voice fades completely. Before Snake has time to process, soldiers appear and forcibly carry Dr. Madnar away. Snake's heart races as he looks up to see Grey Fox in Metal Gear D looming over him. In a cold, authoritative tone, Grey Fox commands Snake to leave Zanzibar land, to abandon the mission and go home. But Snake walked back down that easily. His voice, filled with defiance, echoes across the crevice as he shouts at Grey Fox that he won't be rid of him so quickly. With no leads, Holly calls Snake and informs him that there should be a hang glider on the east side of the first floor of Zanzibar's building, that she saw it once at Thanksgiving. With that intel, Snake needs to get across the crevice and proceed to his task objectives to complete the mission he's been set out to do. Snake re-enters the Zanzibar building, again, returning to the familiar area where his mission began. With the level 6 keycard Gustava gave him, he unlocks a massive door guarded by mannequins, aware that one of them may be a concealed soldier lying in wait. Moving with caution, Snake retrieves the glider and sets off more towards the tower. Before Snake leaves for the tower building, he decides to investigate a possible lead involving Gustava's brooch. The item she left had a certain weight to it, hinting at more than just the memento. Heading to the elevator, he rides up to the fourth floor and makes his way to the east side of the mess hall. There, he finds a door leading into a freezer room. Inside the cold, dimly lit space, the temperature bites through the air. It dawns on him why this would have meant something to Gustava, a former Olympic figure skater. Her life had revolved around the ice. Perhaps she had left a final clue hidden in something as seemingly ordinary as a brooch. Snake waits in the cold. The brooch begins to change, slowly morphing under the frigid temperature. It reshapes into a key, one with purpose yet to be discovered. Snake now makes his way to the tower. Inside, he locates the second elevator station, aiming to reach the roof and glide across the crevice. But just as he prepares for his ascent, his codex springs to life with an ominous call from Grey Fox. Grey Fox declares their friendship is over, chiding Snake for not heeding his warnings earlier. Then, with a chilling finality, he hints that the elevator will be Snake's tomb. And as the elevator grinds to a halt, the ceiling suddenly bursts open, an elite squad drops down, the infamous Four Horsemen, announcing that they have orders from Big Boss himself to eliminate Snake. Realising he's up against a team of specialised in close quarters combat, Snake calls Kazla for intel. Kazla confirms the horseman's deadly reputation. Each one is a veteran of their country's most elite forces, and they are known for dominating tight, confined spaces. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with all of them at once would be a death wish. With this knowledge, Snake formulates a quick strategy. He plants mines across the elevator floor, anticipating the horseman's moves as they close in on him. As they drop from the ceiling, the mines detonate, forcing them into a chaotic retreat and neutralising their advantage. Snake stands his ground, narrowly surviving yet an other seemingly impossible encounter. Once again, he proves why he's earned his reputation as the greatest mercenary in the world, outmanoeuvring a squad of assassins in a death trap set by his own former friend and ordered by his own father. Snake advances through the building, he's met by a hostile squadron determined to stop him. They rush him, forcing him into a relentless chase up 20 floors of stairs. Each landing is an obstacle course in its own right, laced with beams and traps that slow him down. Yet Snake's stamina keeps him a step ahead, pushing him to the top. Finally reaching the balcony, he takes a moment to catch his breath. The gap to the other side of the crevice, the infamous Bridge of Sorrows, stretches wide beneath him. And this time, he only has one way across. Just then, Snake's codec beeps, it's Grey Fox, or should we say, his biggest fan, telling Snake that he needs to wait until the wind direction is blowing north. Snake calmly pulls out his cigarettes, using the smoke to test the wind's direction. With the breeze aligned, he launches himself off the ledge, and with the glider in hand, soaring gracefully across the crevice and the broken bridge below. Of course, Snake successfully clears the gap, leaving his pursuers far behind.
After gliding across the crevice, Snake finds himself in a dense crop field, cloaked in tall vegetation. Suddenly out of the underbush steps a figure, Jungle Evil, claiming mastery over jungle ambush tactics. He melts back into the greenery, hidden and ready to strike. Snake immediately calls Kazla to fill him in. Jungle Evil isn't just any soldier, he's a former hunter from the infamous Rex Command, an expert in guerrilla combat. Legends say he's more than beast than man, able to disappear into the jungle at will. In Vietnam and Yemen, he reportedly wiped out two entire companies on his own, leaving only whispers of his presence. Snake quickly realises he needs to keep his wits about him rather than allowing himself to be drawn into a deadly game of hide and seek. He stays close to cover, moving cautiously within a small area, forcing Jungle Evil to come to him. With calculated precision, Snake uses grenades to flush his opponent from hiding spots, breaking down his ambush tactics. The strategy works and after an intense fight, Jungle Evil is defeated, dropping a keycard as he falls. Snake retrieves the card and moves on. Finding himself at the entrance to a biological research lab, the facility is a fortress of high-tech security with an alert system that has filled the air with gas. Personnel are seen wearing gas masks and the area is rumoured to hold research of genetic engineering and possibly even biological warfare. Rare animals from Zanzibar land, including the elusive Zanzibar wood owl and the venomous Zanzibar snake, are studied within these walls. Navigating the lab's defences is not no easy feat. Snake stays out of sight using his trusty cardboard box, and with a careful eye on his surroundings, he lights up a cigarette using the smoke to reveal laser sensors crisscrossing in his path. Avoiding the deadly beams, he slips past the cameras and grabs a rare owl egg, an unexpected yet critical find in this facility. Snake enters the detention camp, a grim place used by Zanzibar land to detain prisoners and silence objectors. As he makes his way through, he notices that there is a big tall wall with a gate that is guarded by lasers. At that moment, Snake hears a small chirping noise. Glancing down, he sees an owl egg he picked up in the lab has finally hatched. The little owl blinks up at him and a memory flashes through Snake's mind. His conversation with Jacobson, the zoologist. Jacobson had explained that the Zanzibar soldiers rely on the nocturnal habits of owls to tell the time. That they are so accustomed to hearing owls only after sunset that if one hoots during the day, they assume night has fallen, signalling the end of their shift. With a smirk, Snake realises the owl could be his perfect cover. As he coaxes the owl to let out a soft hoot, tricking one of the guards to press the button to turn the lasers off and resume a slow patrol round the facility. <coughs> Snake pushes further into the depths of the prison's compound, weaving through dimly lit corridors and dodging a charging bulldozer to reach a hidden elevator, leading down into the detention camp's lower levels. As he arrives, his codec beeps, a familiar voice but this time with a chilling warning. Grey Fox, Snake's once ally, now adversary, warns him of Night Fright, a legendary member of the Whispers guerrilla unit known as a Phantom Assassin. Night Fright wears the state-of-the-art camouflage, rendering him nearly invisible and he strikes with silenced weapons, making him the ultimate ghost. Snake calls up Kazla, who, stunned at the mention of Night Fright, confirms Fox's intel, warning that the Phantom is more deadly than any elite soldier, including Green Berets. But Snake, with his tactical prowess, knows how to turn the tables. Using grenades to force the assassin to reveal his position, Snake takes advantage of each sound and soon takes down the Phantom. As the dust settles, Night Fright's defeat leads Snake to a level 9 card, a key item in his mission. Snake advances then in a hazardous lab filled with acid pulls, using his rations to absorb the toxic spills. He manoeuvres through until another call from Grey Fox informs him that he'll need to backtrack to find the level 9 keycard that was previously lost by Night Fright. After a tense return to the crop field, Snake retrieves the card and then heads back to the detention camp. Upon entering a secure room with the card, Snake finds Dr. Madnar waiting, his demeanour oddly tense. In the corner, Snake notices Dr. Marv lying on a bed face down, with bruises, signs of a fatal assault. Madnar coldly assures Snake that while Marv may be dead, the Oilix plans remain safe. Hinting that Marv left a microfilm copy hidden in a game cartridge, he often received a part of a monthly shipment. Madner explains the MSX cartridge from a company called Konami, prompting Snake to quip, 
The world's best brand in computers, huh? Breaking the fourth wall, the game takes a moment to reference itself, but with this cartridge holding far more importance than a typical gaming relic, or perhaps the game is hinting that it's a simulation. Madnar hints that the cartridge is locked in a nearby locker, though he doesn't seem to know where the key might be. Snake having Gustavus brooch that doubles as a key plays along. Just as Snake prepares to act, he receives an urgent call from Holly White. She reveals that Madnar was working against them all along and after Oilix for himself, and now that he's not who he seems to be. When confronted, Madnar snaps, admitting that it was he who informed Foxes of Snake's location, leading to Gustavus' death on the Bridge of Sorrows. Enraged, Madnar lunges at Snake, wrapping him up in a rear naked chokehold. With no time to waste, Snake plants mines at Madnar's feet, forcing him to release his grip and collapse. After finally opening the locker with Gustavus' brooch, Snake enters a hidden crawl space infested with Zanzibar lethal venomous hamsters. Taking them down one by one, Snake reaches the cartridge left by Marv and heads out. But before he can leave, however, Madnar lying in his last breath reveals that Big Boss's plans to use Metal Gear as one final act. He gives Snake a critical tip, that Metal Gear's armour is weakest at its legs. Using grenades on the legs is the only way to destroy it. But just as Snake absorbs this information, a trap door suddenly opens beneath him, sending him plunging downward. He's alive. And that's where we'll leave off in Zanzibar for now, but for those familiar with Metal Gear's lore, Dr. Madnar does reappear, surviving his injuries and reuniting with his daughter Ellen. He goes into hiding in Eastern Europe, where by the events of MGS4, he's a secluded figure still working on robotics. He later saves Raiden, providing him with critical assistance after he becomes a cyborg. Madnar's story, like so many in Metal Gear Saga, blends betrayal and redemption in an ongoing conflict between technology and humanity. But he's more certainly well still alive and well after the events of Zanzibar. Dr. Madnar, he saved my life. Dr. Madnar, I've heard of him. A world-renowned cybernetics expert. Strictly underground, though. We're in luck, then. So as many of you over the years are aware, there's been a lot of cut content across the Metal Gear series. MGS4's had its fair share of that as well. Now one in particular codec call was unearthed a few years back and it got fans excited because it dug into Dr. Madnar, a character with deep history in the early MSX Metal Gear games. But here's the thing, just as quickly as it resurfaced the internet, this codec call was scrubbed from YouTube and nearly everywhere else online. It's almost as if it was never meant to see the light of day. But luckily for us, I managed to record it a while back when it was released, so let's take a little look at what's been said. Dr. Madnar offered Sonny and Naomi his full support. He's going to lend them a dialysis machine. No charge. Hmm, good to hear. I hear you saved the doctor and his little girl back at Outer Heaven. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Always good to help others. That reminds me, Madnar wanted me to tell you, his daughter Ellen is married now. Kids too, three of them. And one more thing, he said to tell you he's sorry. Yeah. Jumping back into Zanzibar, Snake falls through the trap door and hears Grey Fox's voice echoing in the distance, claiming that there is no way to destroy Metal Gear. Snake moves into a small hangar room where Metal Gear D approaches with heavy metallic foots, in each one making the ground tremble with its sheer size. Its towering frame looms over Snake, equipped with missile launchers and heavy machine guns. Unlike its predecessor, the TX-55, which was a mobile, Metal Gear D now has the ability to walk, making it a far more formidable and mobile threat. Snake being the badass he is wastes no time in tossing grenades, quickly figuring out Metal Gear's AI patterns, timing the machine gun fire and missile launchers, he knows getting too close would mean instant death, so constant movement is key. Swiftly dodging each attack, he focuses on destroying the weak spots in Metal Gear D's armour. Ultimately, Snake emerges victorious, proving that even Grey Fox's formidable skills weren't enough to defeat him in this battle here. 
But of course, it's not over yet. As Metal Gear D is destroyed, Gray Fox exits the cockpit and makes his way out of the room. Snake, still burning from the blast, frantically strips off his equipment to put the flames out. Once the fire's out, Snake chases after Grey Fox to retrieve the cartridge. The two finally come face to face. Grey Fox, full of excitement, declares that her area is a minefield and challenges Snake to an honourable hand-to-hand -hand fight. He speaks of this being the final confrontation between the two greatest rivals in Foxhound, eagerly anticipating the battle. Snake mutters that he'll beat some sense into Grey Fox, to which Fox responds by revealing why they call him Fox. And with that, the fight to the death begins. Snake quickly calls Kazla in the heat of battle. Kazla over the codec explains a little more about Grey Fox. He reveals that Grey Fox was the last man to hold the title of Fox in Big Boss's ranks and had been decorated five times for his service. Snake implying that he knows exactly how dangerous Grey Fox is, acknowledges that he fought alongside him many times before. Kazla continues adding that about 10 years ago in the mercenary trade, Grey Fox was known as Hunter, a name that in German, means Jaeger. Kazler explains how politics played a key role in tipping Grey Fox over the edge, when the West denied Gustavus asylum. It was in the final blow he became disillusioned with politics and developed a deep hatred for it. Snake determined listens closely as Kazler goes on. He tells Snake that if he defeats Grey Fox, the legend will spread that Solid Snake is the greatest mercenary that ever lived. I was a fan of Foxhound way back, and guys like you and my uncle were in it. None of that gene therapy like there is today. You guys were real heroes. There are no heroes in war. All the heroes I know are either dead or in prison. The other. Are you the snake? <sighs> they said you were dead. No, not me. There are still too many things I need to do. Snake, you're a legend, and that's why I need to ask you this. Legend? A legend is nothing but fiction. Someone tells it, someone else remembers. Everybody passes it on. Flesh and bone collide, Grey Fox remains agile, keeping Snake on his toes, trying to throw him off balance. But Snake stays grounded, knowing that the mines outside are instant death. Using his quick reflexes, he counters Grey Fox's blows, and after a grueling intense battle, Snake finally knocks Grey Fox to the ground. Beaten and broken, Grey Fox lies lifeless on the ground, sharing a few final and precious moments with Snake, the only man he ever truly called a friend. Fox, breath heavy and words scarce, begins to pass down his legacy, conceding that it's finally time to give up the title of Fox. He admits the situation is complicated and begins to reveal the history that binds him to Big Boss. Rank explains that while Big Boss might seem like another CEO, he saved his life, not once, but twice, and long before Foxhound. The first time was in Vietnam when Frank was a child of mixed heritage, perhaps both Vietnamese and half German, in a land that forced his kind into brutal labour camps after the war. Big Boss rescued him from that hell, much like the countless children who would later be brought to Zanzibar. The second time, Frank was a tortured soldier in Mozambique, a prisoner who had suffered so much that he was barely even human. They cut off his ears and nose, and once again Big Boss pulled him out. In this vulnerable moment, Grey Fox admits his hatred of war, but also his need for it. War is all he knows. It's an only way to survive. In the normal world, he'd be lost. But in Big Boss's world, there was a place for men like him, where the battlefield was home. Conflict is in their blood, he confesses. It's as much as part of them as life itself. Frank explains that he was born on the battlefield, and that he will die there too. It's the only thing he knows, the only thing he's capable of. He tries to explain, with his voice breaking slightly, that he could never make someone happy or build a peaceful life with someone. Snake Payne tells Grey Fox to rest, assuring him he won't follow the same path. But Grey Fox with a faint smile tells Snake to fight on, and to never let his fans down. It suddenly clicks for Snake. Grey Fox was the only one giving him support over the codec all along. Call it payback for my selfishness, Frank says. With his voice barely a whisper, as he fades, Snake gives him one last comfort. Gustavo will be waiting for him on the other side. It's a tragic end to a complicated relationship, a friendship forged on the battlefield, understood by those who have lived and died in the chaos of war. Frank Yeager. What? Big Boss's most trusted lieutenant, and the only member of Foxhound ever to receive the code name Fox. Gray Fox. I learned a lot from him. But didn't you try to kill each other? That's true. We did, in Zanzibar. But it was nothing personal. We were just professionals on opposite sides, that's all. 
And you still call yourself friends? Hard to believe. War is no reason to end a friendship. That's insane. I first met him on the battlefield. He was being held a prisoner of outer heaven, but he didn't look like a prisoner to me. He was always so cool and precise. I was still green, and he showed me the ropes. The next time I saw him on the battlefield, we were enemies. We were fighting barehanded in a minefield. I know it sounds strange to most people, but we were just two soldiers doing our jobs. It's like a sport. Men in their games. Finally, Snake comes face to face with his true father, Big Boss. He stands there, machine gun in hand, a vision from Snake's nightmares, alive and looming. Shocked, Snake can hardly believe it. He thought Venom Snake was the real Big Boss back in Outer Heaven and had already put the chapter to rest. But here he stands, the man who has haunted him for three years, and Snake tells him he's come to end these nightmares once and for all. Big Boss's response is chilling. He tells Snake that the nightmares never leave you, they become a part of you. Once you've been on the battlefield and tasted the rush of adrenaline, the constant tension, it changes you permanently. The warrior inside awakens, never to sleep again. You begin craving more tension, more thrills, and it's never about power, money, or even pleasure. Only war can satisfy that hunger. Big Boss claims he's simply given Snake a purpose, a place to channel that need, a reason to live. Disgusted, Snake calls him a hypocrite. Big Boss gestures to the children in Zanzibar land, the innocent victims of wars around the world, now trained to become soldiers in the next conflict. His system, he explains, is brutally efficient. Start a war, fan its flames, create victims, then save them and then turn them into soldiers who will fight in the next battle. This is the world of mercenaries like them, a world where conflict never ends. And so neither does the purpose, their purpose. He tries to convince Snake that they are valuable on the battlefield. But back in society, they're nothing. They are fitted to die like dogs, forever bound to the battlefield. Snake, undeterred, tells Big Boss he has one fight left in him. To free himself from Big Boss's grip and rid himself of these nightmares. He's determined to defeat him. Big Boss, almost amused, recalls something similar that the boss once told him. It doesn't matter who wins here. Their fight will continue. The loser will be liberated from the battlefield, while the victor will remain living out his days as a soldier. With a smug grin, Big Boss claims he'll put Snake out of his misery once and for all. One must die, and one must live. No victory, no defeat. The survivor will carry on the fight. It is our destiny. The one who survives will inherit the title of Boss. And the one who inherits the title of Boss will face an existence of endless battle. Snake with defiance declares his love for life and doesn't want any more favours from his father. Big Boss mocking him reminds that Snake is unarmed. But Big Boss is a former shadow of himself, he's no longer the honourable naked Snake we remember. But Snake drawing strength from his past echoes a principle instilled by him by his very own father. That you can't give up, and you always have to believe you'll succeed, even when the odds are stacked against you. With that, Big Boss declares this will be their last and final battle to decide who will carry on the fight. And so father and son face each other knowing that only one will walk away from this final showdown. One must live, and one must die. This is without question the hardest test of Snake's life. Facing off against a legendary soldier, a man once regarded as the greatest of his time, is one thing. But standing across from Big Boss also means confronting his own father. It's not just a battle of skill, it's a brutal clash of ideologies and legacies. Yet Snake, with his relentless determination and sharp instincts, knows that it's time for a new generation to rise on the battlefield. Armed with only a can of deodorant and a lighter, Snake improvises with his trademark resourcefulness. In a final desperate move, he manages to set Big Boss ablaze, engulfing him in a ball of fire. As the flames consume his former mentor, it appears that Snake has put an end to the man who cast a long dark shadow over his life. Snake makes his way through the ruins of Zanzibar, weary but alert, when a figure in Zanzibar's soldier uniform appears from behind. Snake spins around only to realise it's Holly White in disguise. 
and after a brief exchange with some light-hearted small talk, Snake calls for an extraction, informing the pilot, Charlie, that he's secured the cartridge containing Dr. Marv's precious oilix plants. As they make their escape, the two are chased through Zanzibar by relentless patrols. Holly hands Snake a gun to fend off the enemies as they race to the rendezvous point. But as Snake runs out of ammo, they see Charlie's helicopter arriving just in time. Exhausted but relieved, Snake can finally breathe as he climbs aboard with Holly. With the mission finally behind him, Snake shares his anticipation of making it home in time for Christmas, half joking that he's tired of the terrible rations. Holly smiles, adding that they should make it in time for dinner. As they fly off into the sunset with Operation Intrude, F-014 successfully completed, Snake contemplates the journey he's endured. During the debriefing, Campbell tries once again to recruit him back into Foxhound, but Snake declines, claiming that his nightmares are finally over. Snake confirms the authenticity of the cartridge he retrieved by pointing out that Dr. Mark's signature clearly embedded backward on the MSX loading screen. Although Snake had promised to share a Christmas dinner with Holly after the mission, he ultimately vanishes once again, slipping into the shadows without a trace. As Campbell hints, it's not the first time Snake has disappeared without warning, solidifying the myth of a lone warrior who, despite everything, remains bound to the battlefield. Following the end of Operation Intrude F-014, Snake returned to North America where he was soon scouted by the CIA. Although he spent six months as an undercover agent, Snake quickly grew disillusioned with the organisation and decided to leave, somewhat like his father. He seeks solitude and he retires now in the Alaskan wilderness, setting at the Twin Lakes. Here, Snake tried to come to terms with his war-torn past and confront the reality of killing his own father. Despite his retreat, the scars of war remained, the military had deemed his record tarnished by a series of incidents, enough to warrant a prison sentence should he ever be brought to justice. Struggling with PTSD, Snake began drinking heavily as he tried to bury the haunting memories. Over time, he found a measure of peace in the wilds of Alaska, where he became a dog sled racer. Raising and caring for 50 Huskies, his skill and determination even saw him complete in the Iditarod channeling his warrior spirit in a new battle against nature itself. And that wraps up the story behind the Zanzibar land disturbance. I just want to thank you all for watching and supporting me on this journey. I love Metal Gear Solid as much as you do, and together we keep the spirit of this legendary series alive. And this video is to any newcomers who may be learning about Metal Gear for the first time. I hope this video brought you closer to an essential chapter of its lore for anyone who hasn't played the MSX games because they are a bit difficult to play by today's standards. I hope this gives you an insight to a pivotal moment in the series' history. Maybe one day Konami will realise the value of bringing these classic stories back to life in a modern cinematic experience. Until then, don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment down below what you love most about Metal Gear. This is The Voice Box, signing off and until we meet again. Colonel, I don't work for the government anymore. Let me go back to Twin Lakes. Why, Snake? Is your life in Alaska all that great? There's a dog sled race this week. Next Saturday, I have to be in Anchorage. Get dinner, Rod? The longest sled race in the world? When did you become a dog musher? Right now, my 50 Huskies are my only family. I've got to take care of them. Don't worry about your dogs. What do you mean? I'm sorry, Snake, but this vessel is headed for the Bering Sea. There's no room for debate. I told you, even if I do owe you, I don't owe anything to this army or this country. You will accept this assignment.